Nashrote Arif Nisa Takže nežít, řeknu něco k Arif Meetupům Pro ty, co jsou tady třeba poprvé, tak je to pravidelné setkání a druhý urážů Máme vždycky nějakou zajímavou přednášku Pak jsou dotazy, diskuze a pak, pak se jde na aftopárty do nějaké místní restaurace Uh, jinak už to probíhalo minulý, minulý semestr a uh, teď se mění uh, hlavní organizátor, což byl Ondřej Kučera a teď jsem to já, že Ondra uh, odjel na Tajván na půl roku. Uh, to, trošku chci změnit uh, tu koncepci, že uh, my jsme vždycky scháněli ty speakery a já bych chtěl i trochu zapojit, do to, zapojit vás, uh, kdyby Kdyby jste si chtěli třeba o něčem naučit, o nějakém tématu s Androidem a pak, pak o tom ostatním říct, tak je to možný. Tady jsem udělal dokument s tématama jako pro inspiraci. To pak ještě na sdíle, můžete se na to podívat. Neznamená, že musíte být jako odborník na to, na to konkrétní, nějaký, na action bar nebo na něco, nebo na nějaký mapový API nebo takové věci, a že se o tom můžete naučit a pak pak podělit se s ostatníma třeba i v zkrácené podobě, než, než tady ta přednáška. Je to určitá možnost. Je tam seznam témat, ale neznamená to, že, že musíte se tím řídit, je to jenom jako krámcově. Takže máme naplánováno tenhle semestr pět setkání, vždycky každé druhé úterý v měsíci. Tohle je první tohle semestru a už máme sehnanýho speakera na příští měsíc. 12.3. tady a bude to Tomáš Vodráček z InMind a bude mluvit o animacích Androidu. Docela, docela dobou, které jsou to docela tajmu. No a teď ještě předám slovo Tomáši Ukinovi o Fondovaru. Tak děkuji, Davide, díky za předání slova. Já ještě když se pustím k tomu, co je to Fondovaru, vás tady chci uvítat i jménem GDG ČVUT, která vlastně tady tuhle tu akci pro vás připravuje, je už tady David Jansen členem, ostatně my všichni. A není to jenom GDG ČVUT, díky kterému tady dnes můžete sedět, je to i Fakulta informatiky, která nám tady poskytuje tyhle ty super prostory. A dalším právě sponzorem nebo partnerem projektu je Formobile. Někteří z vás to možná uznáte. Formobile jsou pravidelná setkávání dvorářů mobilních aplikací. Kdy nyní, teď vlastně jsme měli i Androidní setkávání a teď jsme je propojili právě do těchto z těch ADF Meetups. Pro ty z vás, kteří chtějí nakouknout kromě toho Androida i pod pokličku iOS, máme v rámci formovat tentokrát připravit o setkání o iOS, které bude za týden. Kdybyste měli zájem, tak více informací se dají tady na stránkách formovat na info. Jo, jinak formoval obecně to iOSové, se koná každé pondělí v měsíci a jak už David říkal, ADF Meetup je tady každé, pardon, každé pondělí, každé třetí pondělí, to bylo moc často. A každé to druhé pondělí je tedy ADF Meetup. Tak a ještě jeden slide, tak to je zase ten první zájem. Tak já bych nyní chtěl předat slovo zpátky Davidovi, který vám představí našeho speakera a tak vůbec. Tak Davide, pracím v tady stejně. No, tak dnešní speaker se jmenuje Janik Stucky, je to Švýcar, bude nám uživat, je voládám z Turiku. Já jsem ho potkal, když jsem byl na internshipu v Google v Londýně, tak je to i můj kamarád. A jinak je to Android vývojář, teď aktuálně pracuje pro YouTube tým Google Zurich. Je to hrozně tajný, ne nemohu říct, co jako konkrétně dělá. A tak asi něco s Androidem tím řek. A... <laughs> Dneska bude mluvit o svojí aplikaci Tasks, kterou, kterou ještě vydal, ještě než nastoupil do Google. Takže netýká se to přímo Google, týká se to prostě jeho osobní aplikace, která se stala hodně úspěšná. A řekne nám o tom, jak se můžeme poučit z toho jeho úspěchu. Já tam to Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, very good. Uh, okay. I, I already introduced you in Czech, uh, so uh, you, you can show your presentation. Okay, I'm going to switch these slides. 
So, hello, I'm, I'm Yannick, and I'm going to talk to you about building all the awesome Android apps. Um, just before you start, David has already told me that I work for Google in Zurich, but this is not an official talk by Google, I have to say this so I don't get into trouble. So all this stuff here is unrelated to my actual profession. I don't work uh, on Android at Google, so this was all done before I joined. Okay, so let's start. So three friends and I started about a year ago to work on an application called Tasks. It's a very simple task manager with the primary goal to uh, sync with Google Tasks. Um, this is the uh, a screenshot from the Play Store. Um, from our paid version, and as you can see on the bottom right in the tiny font, we actually have uh, over 100,000 installs, so I guess we, we were quite successful, and this is why I'm here to talk to you and give um, you some insights to why we became so successful, and maybe give you a few tips that you can learn from this. Now also we have quite good reviews, as you can see. Uh, I will also talk about what you can do to get good reviews, and also we are uh, ranked quite highly in the productivity category. Now, what do you need to do to make an uh, awesome Android app? Well, <laughs> first, you need to have some luck that your awesome Android app is even recognized by the public and that you're kind of getting some initial users. Um, of course, always everyone who is successful has just a bit of luck, but you, um, so I, I don't want to just say we're just really good and this is why it all worked out. But besides luck, of course, you also need to do a good job. Now, there's two components. The first component is you need to have a good idea because with a shitty idea, you're getting nowhere. And the second thing is you need to have great execution. So you need to do a good job in coding and in design and in marketing. However, you don't really need a good idea, so I was lying a bit, because, I mean, tasks is kind of a bad idea. There were already like 20 tasks up out there. I mean, nobody can say this was like a great new idea. So what I really want to try to tell you, I mean, it's great if you have a new and good idea, but what I really want to try to tell you today is that it really matters how well you execute so that you have a successful and an awesome app. If your idea is good, then even better. But if your idea is just something that is already out there, but you do a better job, then you can still have quite an awesome app. Now, um, when we look at execution, I will talk about three things. I will talk a bit about, initially, about marketing and, and what you have to get right from the very beginning so that your app will be successful. Then I will really talk about one aspect on design. And then I will very, very briefly talk about some coding techniques. Now let's start with marketing. The most important thing, in my opinion, when it comes to the Android market, and I'm sure this is also true to many other things, like for example the iOS App Store, is you should have a finished product on day one. I know it is very um, popular in open source community, for example, to have this launch early and iterate idea where you kind of make a beta version and you put it out there and you see how users like it and, 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 and this kind of stuff. But if you really want to be successful on Android market, you should do the beta testing and everything earlier with your friends and when you actually launch, you should have everything ready. Now why is that? Well, first of all, the first impression counts. Users are very unforgiving. They're very likely to uninstall your app very fast if it's not working or just a beta version. Also, ratings will not change. People will give you one or two star ratings, they will uninstall the app, and then later you will have those ratings forever. So this is why you really need to have a really good version first, so you get those four and five star ratings. And then on Android, there's also this new app section. It is very hard to get discovered, and to be like in the top pay, for example, on productivity as we are, but what is quite or reasonably easy is to get into the new apps, like new paid, new free app section, and I think you only have about 30 days or maybe 60, I'm not sure, where you're actually in this section, so if your app is not doing well in the very beginning, it will never do well. So that's another reason. And then also blog reviews. Blogs, they like to review apps, 
but they like to review good apps and new apps. And if your app is better after two months, they might not review your app um, anymore. Now, this day one, this should be your perfect day. And I want to um, share with you what we did to have a, a perfect launch day. So, first of all, we really wanted to have good design and, and responsive design, and we'll talk about this term later. So, for example, on the first day, we had a tablet and a phone layout. As you might know from all the blogs and stuff, Android doesn't have as many tablet apps as maybe um, iOS. And there's many developers who were neglecting the tablets, and they were just saying there's no market for the tablets. But those are just lazy developers who are writing about something instead of making actually a tablet app. So what we did, we said on the first day, we have a tablet and a phone app, and it makes the users actually happy right away. And they will not whine about it in the comments. You don't want comments on the first day saying, this sucks on tablets. The same thing goes for landscape and for trace support. I mean, almost all the apps have it, but still some apps launch, and you can only hold it, for example, you can only hold your phone upright and not sideways, and they think, well, we will add this later, but in the meantime, we will get a lot of bad comments. Another thing, for example, that is very important on Android is a widget. If your app, if it makes sense for your app to have a widget, and you try to launch without one, you will just have hundreds of comments saying, we want a widget. And there's no point in getting those comments if you could just do the widget in the first place. Uh, another thing we learned is that customer support is really important. If you actually start becoming successful, you will get a lot of emails. In those emails, people will have problems. Um, so please help them to solve those problems. And in those emails, also, they will have a lot of ideas. However, most people will have the same three, four ideas. So you will get like 20 emails from people who want one thing and 20 emails from people who want something else. But be patient with them and have a way that you can respond quickly. We actually had um, comments on the Play Store saying five stars. Those guys have great customer support. I never thought they would answer me and they actually answer my emails. So it, it really makes people happy because they don't expect that you answer their emails quickly. And if you do, it just makes them super happy and they will tell all the friends and give you a good rating. Um, another thing that we thought we should do, and it actually turned out quite successful, is do a little demo video. Um, you don't have to be a professional to make such a video. You just take yourself an afternoon with your friends and make a video where you showcase your app. So this is a screenshot from YouTube, and you see our video has gotten 440,000 views in the meantime. Why did we get so many views? Because many people who look at our app, they will watch this video first, and in one and a half minutes, we just showcase the most basic overview. You can search for this video later on YouTube. Um, we even put a catchy music underneath and pay $15 uh, for the music just to have a just to have some better quality of this video. And it actually helped. Just three days ago, we got a comment saying, the app is great, but the video is even better. Nice one. <laughs> so, so, I mean, really, the video seems to be a big part of, uh, of the initial impression. You're just that much more professional if you have a nice video. <clears throat> now, a last thing, and maybe, and an important thing if you want to get known is having a story, and, and I will just tell you now what I mean by this. So we thought when we when we launched our app, we want to not just have an app, but we want to have a story which the blogs can bring. And maybe it was worse last year, but everyone was always whining about Android fragmentation and the lack of tablet apps and blah 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 blah. So we thought, let's use this to our advantage. So we thought we're going to have a tablet design on day one. We're going to have a whole design. This is the new design style from Android 4.0. But we're going to be backwards compatible to an older version of Android that almost everybody has this version or a newer version. We're going to have a simple UI that doesn't suck. Um, and with this, we got on Android and, and then later on the Verge, which is a huge tech site within hours. So our idea was, instead of whining about the tablet, instead of having shitty design or not compatible Android, we try to do all this that the blogs always write about. We do it right, and then we tell that we, we, um, 
we wrote a lot of blogs with a little press release saying, look, we actually do this all right on the first day. This is a great story for you to write about. And that was actually very successful. So if you have, a, if you have an app and you can, you can kind of think about a story for the blog so that they can write about you, and you kind of market it this way, it, it, I think this is a, a good tactic to get recognition on blogs, right? Because there's so many apps and why should you write about your app? Now, another thing is uh, localization, which is very important to many users. Um, but I don't think it's a day one thing, at least not if you're a big company, because it's, it's a lot of work. And actually, you can use the crowd to translate. There's, uh, for example, we used getlocalization.com. You, you can look on slash ask how many languages we have. And people, if, if you do a good product, people are very willing to later translate your strings. Um, but of course, if they help you translate, try to also launch these new strings soon after the translation finishes. We also are sometimes guilty of this, because people put some effort into the translation, so they want the translation in the app fast. Now, one last thing I talk about in this whole marketing section is the business model. So what did we actually do? We have a free app and paid app with exactly the same functionality. I know there's many apps out there where you have a free app and then, for example, at some point you try to do something and it tells you there's a little pop-up saying you can only do this in the paid version, please upgrade. Um, I don't know how well those apps are doing in terms of sales, maybe they're doing better than we do, but I don't think you're doing a really good job for the user if you do that. You should give the user the best possible app. So in the free free app, we only put some ads, actually only after 10 days, so that they can get used to our app. And after 10 days, we activate the ads. And otherwise, it's exactly the same as the paid app. And it worked actually quite well for us, um, because there were some users that were writing a CMS, or they, they were writing on Google Play, that they, they bought the paid version, even though they were using Adblock. So for them, there was not even a difference in the free and the paid app. But they just wanted to support us. They were happy to spend money. Um, and in our case, this paid revenue is much greater than the ad revenue. So many people are always talking about this, that it's hard to make money on Android. But maybe we were just lucky. But we actually have a large fraction of our downloads in the paid version. And I think if you do a good, clean job, and they see this is a product which is stable, they, are actually, they actually don't mind putting in a dollar or two. And also users love sales, so we had a sale in the beginning where we put the, the cost in every country to the minimum cost which was allowed, which is roughly a dollar, and it's a bit different in other countries. And, and we were just writing into sale, and users loved it because users love sales. I mean, it was a sale, and then after 30 days or so, we wanted to put it to two dollars or two dollars fifty. I don't even know anymore. But what was actually surprising is nobody bought our app anymore. We had like 20 times less sales. I, and we thought initially that, well, if it's going to be two instead of one dollar, who cares? They already decided to spend some money, so does it really matter if they spend one or two dollars? Uh, I don't know how it is for other apps. There's a lot of successful apps that sell for three, four dollars. But in case of our app, we, we really saw that um, we are selling nothing if we sell it for more than a dollar, which is fine. So we just put it back to a dollar, and ever since we just sold it yeah, for a dollar. Um, then there's also the question of in app purchases. Uh, maybe you know that inside of the app you could also purchase stuff. We don't support this, but you could, for example, think that you have only one app with ads, and then you could do a purchase to get rid of the ads in the app and kind of transform your free into a paid version. This is actually better for the user because he doesn't have to download the new app. However, uh, and, and actually what is also nice is that you have only one app. So all the downloads from the free and the paid version, they don't count together as one. Uh, we actually decided against this because there's also some downsides. For example, if you only have a paid app, you will have a lot better ratings on the paid app because only the people who really love it will buy the paid app. It's actually quite nice. And also the paid app will have a better ranking because there's so many free apps. Having a good ranking in the free apps is really hard, but having a good ranking in paid apps is much easier compared to 
background in Kubernetes and free apps. So we actually decided to go against um, the in-app purchases and have the dual app model. Uh, I don't know if one of them works better than the other, but for us, this dual model has worked quite well. Okay, so this was the marketing thing. So what the key thing to take away from here really if you want to be successful on the Android market, you really have to plan the launch of your app and you have to make sure that on the first day everything is ready and everything is almost perfect uh, and this way you can actually get the attention of the blogs and then you can start getting users and downloads. Now in the second part I want to talk about design. Um, on Android it is very important that you use the so-called hollow design language and there's a developer guide with a design guide uh, which describes in detail this design language. It's, it's really refined, it's really easy to use, and it gives you great results. And users love it. Um, because users, they will, uh, will even write to you, like, this is so great that you're using this, and others are not. Users don't want to have another port of an iPhone application, they want it to look like Android. Now, within design, I cannot talk about too much, but I've got one favorite topic, which is responsive design. So let me just give you um, an example of this. Now, what is responsive design? Um, I, I don't have a definition, but basically it says that an application should adapt to any screen size, screen orientation, or device configuration. And you know, on Android, there is like big phones, like the Galaxy Note, there is small phones, there is 10-inch tablet, there is 7-inch tablet, and your application should look great on any of those devices, whether you hold them horizontally or vertically. Now, one very prominent example of how to make uh, use of this additional space on tablets, for example, is the two-pane view. So, I took some pictures from the design guide. For example, in this context application, I hope you can see it, you have on the left a list of names, and on the right you have a detail, details for a selected name. Uh, whereas on the phone you would have two separate screens for, for this information. And then of course it's much nicer on the tablet to have it both next to each other. Another example maybe is this Gmail application, where in landscape you can see the, the emails and the open email, and in portrait you can only see the open email as if it were on the phone. Now, there's this concept or this uh, one tricky thing that comes into it, and this is called rotational stability. Um, I actually have this name from Google I.O. 2012. And the problem is, imagine, let's go back to this application. Imagine you're turning the tablet now uh, from portrait to landscape. Uh, there's no problem in turning the app here because, uh, I mean, there's no problem, you, you can see it. It's easy to turn, it will just change the dimensions a bit. However, if you're in this Gmail application, it's a bit trickier, because if you're in landscape, you see the list and the details. And then if you flip to portray, what will you see? Will you see the list, or will you see the details? Or even worse, imagine you're in portray first, and you flip back to the list per accident, and then you flip, uh, you flip back to landscape, and you flip back to portray, you end up in the same spot as you were before. So I hope it is clear, but there's some trickiness because in, in, one, in one orientation you have one view, and in, other, in the other orientation you have two view, and if you transition from one to the other, it's not clear in which view you should end up. So at Google I.O., they suggested that you use the same number of paints in portray and landscape. So this is what happens here, you have the two paints in both orientations, so there's no rotational problem. However, I'm not very happy with the suggestion, um, and they actually have another suggestion. Uh, let me first show you some screenshots from tasks. So in tasks, if we have a portray, the list view, or if we have landscape, the list view, we, we only show the list. So this is portray, and then in landscape, when we show the same thing, we, we show the list view on the left, but we don't select one of the tasks yet. We don't show the detailed view on the right. Um, now let's look in portray what the detailed view looks like. So this is when you edit the task. It's only the detailed view. And then if you go to landscape, you will still see the list view on the left, and you will see that lines is uh, selected. Um, um, 
So, um, so let me backtrack a bit again. So, uh, what I have here is I have um, views, but I don't have the same number of panels as suggested, right? So I have only one view here, I have two views here. But I want to say that rotation is easy because if you're in the list view, in portrait, you will navigate to this screen where no task is select in landscape. You see this? So you, you navigate from this to this, okay? Or if you're in the details view, you will navigate in landscape to the details view open together with the list view. And if you have this open, you will navigate back to this. So the solution of the problem is have to have a one-on-one -on -one mapping of navigational space between portray and landscape. And I do this by introducing an empty version of the detail view. The empty version is this view here. Now, uh, and, and if you think about it, this solves the rotation problem, because now it is clear if I'm in this view, uh, and I want to rotate, I rotate this view. Um, if I'm in this landscape view and I want to rotate, I will rotate into the uh, uh, detail view on portrait. So, um, <clears throat> I hope this was not too confusing because I can only show one picture at a time. Um, uh, if it was too confusing, you can tell me later again. But it just, it, it, uh, I just wanted to point out that combining different views to make larger view on tablets and, and phones, it is not very straightforward, but by adding a few tricks, you can actually get around some of those problems. Okay, so this was something for the design. I don't have time to cover all the design uh, about Android, but I really suggest that you read this developer guide. It's great, it's got, it has a lot of screenshots and it will explain a lot of things. Now, one last thing is code. Um, I've already said that you need great marketing to have a successful first day, and then I've also said that you need great design to have a successful Android application, because Android users expect a great, great design application. Now, of course you also need good code, uh, because if your app crashes or doesn't behave correctly, users will also not like it. Um, um, in our case, we had some tricky UI code, but that was more or less okay. But the most tricky part in the task application is the synchronization with Google Tasks with the server. Because if you have uh, multiple devices adding tasks and deleting tasks and modifying tasks, making sure that the state is consistent, uh, consistent across all devices is actually very hard. And as you can see in the comment of many of our competitors, Users complain that the sync is broken, that after a while it doesn't sync anymore, or that it, that it syncs wrong stuff. So it's really hard to get the sync tricky. And uh, actually, I have to give credits to some of my friends because I didn't work on this part of the code. But um, we did have a few bugs, and we got user reports and we fixed them. But uh, one key element to make the synchronization work quite well is that we designed it nicely and that we used unit tests. Now, unit tests might not be the most popular thing, about, especially among hobby developers. Um, and they also, in task, we didn't use unit tests to test everything, like we didn't test any UI stuff, but we really unit tested the whole synchronization logic because it is very important that it is correct. With, uh, also because we are dealing with user data and we don't want to mess it up, right? So, and now, uh, I will not tell you too much about testing and stuff, but one thing that helped me with getting to live testing or getting to uh, is the fact that first you need to actually write code which is easy to test. And there's one principle, and this principle is called dependency injection, which really helps to make testable and flexible code. And I'm only very briefly going to um, touch upon this subject, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to refer you to another talk by someone else who talks about this really well, much better than I ever could, and then I just recommend that you watch this and it will help you um, to be a better coder. Now, what is dependency injection? Just a very simple uh, example. Imagine you have in Java a class for a house. And imagine the house needs a door and the house needs a window. You could write this code which kind of creates a doorknob because the door needs a doorknob. And then you create 
the door and you give you the door knob and you assign this to the, to the class house and you also create a new window. Now, if you need to test this class, it is very hard because everything is already wired together. Like, if you want to insert another kind of door to test if the door is working or called properly, you cannot do it. The door is already there. Um, and now, in contrast, dependency injection would give you all the objects which the house needs. So the house doesn't need to create its own door or its own window. The house is just given a door and it's just given a window. And now if you do a unit test, you can also give it different doors and different windows, which maybe don't have the full functionality, but observe how they interact with the house. This is called mocks, if you want to look it up. And the nice thing is the class now does not even need to know about the door knob, which was just created. So, um, but this whole thing of, of how to do this dependency injection is, is quite a large topic. Maybe you already know about this, and I'm just telling you something that you do anyway. But there's a, uh, if you want to learn about this, there's a, a series of talks on YouTube, and I have some links at the end in my slides, and I'm sure David can share them. Um, and I really suggest that you watch those videos and take it because it's, it's not about Android, but it's about Java. But since Android is, uh, is like Java for programming, um, and, and this actually applies to any object oriented language, this will, this will help you. So let's just go then to the last slide and let, let me give you a summary of useful links that I put together. So, okay, let's first talk again about design. So there's a developer guide installing on top, which is very nice. Then, if you're interested more in design, there's also a blog by uh, Yuhani called AndroidRightPublish.com. And the link I give you is actually to a book that you can buy. So he actually wrote a whole book about Android design. And the reason I mention is not because I make any money off this book, because I didn't write it. But there are some screenshots from our application in there as good examples. So of course I have to promote this book. Um, then there's also Google Plus. There's Enter Design and actually Enter Developers, or, uh, or even Enter Designers. There's there's different groups uh, which talk a lot about Enter Design or Enter Development. And, and actually Google Plus is for Enter a really great place to uh, have discussions. There's also people you know you can. You can make a screenshot of your app and, and send it to those people and ask for advice. And there's many people who want to give you feedback. Then another thing that is very important um, is all this great stuff that was introduced in Android 4.0. Most of it can be used on all the devices. There is a compatibility library built into Android. But one thing, for example, is the action bar, which is a design uh, element. It's on top of almost all apps. Um, and there is a library called Action Bar Sherlock, and you can find it on actionbarsherlock.com. And we also use this for tasks, so check this out if you want to make sure your uh, app runs on all devices. Then another thing is uh, Android Office Hours and App Clinic. So uh, in this link, you find the, the Android team. They often announce it on Android developers in Google Plus. They do a lot of sessions where they review apps. So our app was also reviewed once. So they, they, they look at your app and they give you design feedback. Or they have a session where they ask your, uh, you can ask developer questions and they give you answers. So uh, looking there, it's a very nice report. And then, yeah, last but not least, these clean code talks, they're on YouTube. Um, they should be easy to find if you just search for clean code talks. Um, or there's actually the links here, and, and, and those four talks are, are really just great, not just for your testing, but also just to write better code, and at least they help me a lot, and they help us in the project. So, and uh, yeah, with that, I think we're going over to the Q&A um, part. Um, just one last thing to announce, uh, we actually built into our app a system that you can, if you have the free version, you can enter a secret code um, bound to your uh, account with which you're using it so that you can get rid of the app ads. And I told David that uh, I could do this for you. So if, if you're interested, uh, I don't know, David will handle this. He will give me like the list of your email addresses and I will generate codes matching to the email addresses and the instruction. And then you, if you want, you can download our app, the free version without the ads. So, yeah, with that, uh, I give it over to David. Yeah, I want to ask you a document uh, about the email registration. I don't know if you can see it. I don't know if you can see it. I don't know if you can see it. 
Takže teď se přesuneme ke otázkám a odpovědím. Když tak za každou otázku, tak, tak tady musíte dostat. Ne, já mám otázku na testování. Jestli jsem to správně, tak oni nepoužívají unitesty na, na layout. Používají ho pouze na, tu, na testování té synchronizace. Takže mě zajímá, kolik skutečných zařízení mají na testování a jak moc virtualizují. Yes. So uh, the question was is uh, how many testing devices do you have and if you mm -hmm. use some uh, virtualized devices to use the emulator. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, this is a very good question. I actually should have mentioned this. Um, so what we were doing, this was a year ago, so we had a, a Galaxy Nexus as our primary device. Um, the, the Nexus 7 wasn't out yet, so we didn't have a 7 inch tablet, but we had a we had a, I think, a, no, we had a Asus Transformer Prime, so a 10 inch tablet, a 10 inch tablet, a, a normal phone, um, and then we had some older phone with Android 2.2, just to check that it works with the compatibility stuff. Um, and other than that, I tested it once on my mother's Galaxy Note. So basically, we um, we, we we didn't use uh, we didn't use virtual devices. But we only have like, you know, we have one of every category, like one large tablet, one normal phone, one old phone, and now maybe it's good maybe to have a 7-inch tablet as well. Um, actually, what I read about, I haven't tried this myself, but you can set uh, this, if, I don't know if you need root, but there's a way to, if you have a tablet, for example, an Nexus 10, it has like a lot of pixels, and you can set something in the command line that for a while it shrinks its display size to something smaller and you can kind of emulate on the tablet any possible screen size. Um, but actually if you, if you follow everything nicely, the, the whole design, if you do it as it was intended uh, with um, the buckets, uh, like the resources, um, then really one device of every category plus maybe an older device should be enough, and we actually had almost, almost no, uh, almost never we had it that there was a bug for only one device. So, so that's actually. Okay, another question. Kolik lidí na tom, kolik lidí na tom pracovalo, a jak dlouho jsme se volali, že dostali k tomu jazyku? Okay, so the next question is uh, how how many people were in your team? And uh, yeah, how long uh, did it take you to release mm -hmm. the first version? Okay, so we are four people. Um, for the first version, one of the one guy only made uh, graphics, uh, the logo, and uh, in the Play Store you also have this banner um, and a few other graphics. But we didn't need too many graphics, and we had actually three developers. Uh, one guy did mostly the synchronization, I did mostly the UI, and one guy did, I think, kind of the rest, or, or, or everywhere or something. How long did we need? It's hard to say. Uh, I don't know how, maybe two, three months for the first version. Uh, I mean, the app is not too complicated, right? It's quite simple, but we made sure we put enough time into it. But we were, I mean, we weren't working full time on this maybe uh, weekends and you know during the evening during the night. Um, <laughs> how real coders quit during the night? No, uh, uh, no, but we never tracked how much we worked on it, so it, it's hard to say. But um, it, 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 it's not, it wasn't nothing. So we put a lot of work in it, and especially also when it launched, we, we put a lot of work to update it quickly and to the customer support. But it was. It was doable, like three, four guys, uh, and you're serious about it for a few months in your free time, but yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, so that's the same. Yeah, you can do it, 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 you can do it. Next question is uh, if you uh, test the UI automatically somehow, or um, yeah, I think it is possible, um, but no. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I'm, no, I'm sure it. I, I think there's way how to do it, and I know there's also other ways to do it. Um, 
I, I usually try to use something called Model View Presenter. It's similar to Model View Controller, but a bit different. I don't know if you can look it up. But the idea is that you isolate the classes with the view uh, so that they're really stupid. They only kind of set values and, and, and do stuff, like very simple stuff. And you try to have all the logic in, in these presenter classes, and then you can actually test them with fake views. Um, but I know on Android there's a few ways how you can test views. I also know there's something called a monkey. You can kind of have a virtual kind of person click around on your phone very fast, and you can see if it crashes. So it's nice to test for race conditions and stuff, but uh, we actually haven't done that. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. It's actually not really an issue for us because then, so what we use from the new Android it is like the fragments and the, sh the, the, the action bar and, and this kind of stuff and we kind of use the compatibility version of all of those so it wasn't really an extra effort just the, the only thing which we had to really port was the date picker when you choose a date um, but it's actually not really a burden for us right now also new stuff like hardware acceleration it's just turned on for the newer devices and turned on for the older, so it doesn't really bother us. Um, but I don't know what will be in the future. So, but I mean, once you do the porting, then you don't need to worry too much about it. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, uh, is uh, you working at Google at coincidence, or uh, is it related with your work at the tasks? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, actually, um, I signed the contract to work before, or when I about when I started working on it, but before it was released. So, so I, it, it had no connection to me getting hired. Vypracuje na nějaké další aplikace, a případně nějaký nápad na nějakou další aplikaci. Uh, you, uh, on some, uh, other apps? you have some ideas for other apps? Uh, well, now that I actually work on coding, I don't really have too much time to work on my private apps anymore, unfortunately. Um, so I don't work on anything but my friends. Uh, you know, they have some more time, they're still working on stuff, but I, I cannot say what they're working on, so <laughs> it's not my stuff. Uh, so not really known. How many women engineers uh, are in Zurich? Oh, <laughs> I don't want to make any official statements. <laughs> I think, okay, I think what I can say is, so I studied in Zurich at, at ETH, and um, I also don't know how many women engineers there were, but I think in, in percent, there's more women at Google than at my university. So, <laughs> it, it, that's already better, right? So, <laughs> no, but I mean, I, we have women in our teams, and, and I mean, of course, less than 50%, but um, <laughs> there's a substantial amount. More than 5%? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to make any statements. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it, it's not that there's not, and especially if you're a woman, you shouldn't be discouraged at all um, by something like that. It, it, so it's, it's, it's even better, right, if you're interested in such an environment, because, yeah, why not? So I will come. 